They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I don't know if you know this or not, but he and I go to the same barber. <laughs> Well, um, you might be familiar with that gospel story that we just heard. It's typically read on Palm Sunday each year during the liturgical calendar. But it also has something to say to us today because it has to do with our expectations and people's expectations of God. A little background first about that story. We often just think of it as the, uh, the Sunday where we wave palm branches around. But... There's some history here that's very important. At this time in the gospel story, Jesus is at the very height of his fame among the people of the known world at that time. He spent the prior three years of his life and his ministry traveling and teaching and performing miracles. And he's bringing this new and for some strange perspective about God into the world. He's sparked a lot of hope for a lot of people. And he's made a lot of people angry by some of the things he said. Even those highest up in the Roman Empire, the executive branch of the day, if you will, they know his name, they have his profile, and they know all that he has been up to over these past three years. And the mythos surrounding Jesus has worked those who follow him up into a kind of political frenzy. And this is what we see happening here in this passage. It's a rally of sorts. It's a protest of sorts. It's a coronation of sorts. This Jesus is king business, that phrasing we use all the time, king of kings, lord of lords. That meant something very different for the people in this story. My uh, friend Joe Boyd, who's a pastor in Cincinnati, always says the number one rule of Bible interpretation is to remember that people in the Bible did not know they were living in Bible times. <laughs> in other words, they're not acting out a script. This was just happening for them in their life. And this is where the meaning of this story becomes clear if we just acknowledge this one pivotal fact that the crowds awaiting Jesus' arrival in this story in the New Testament had never even heard of anything called the New Testament. It wasn't even written down yet and wouldn't start to be written down yet in, in drips and drafts for almost 20 years from the time this story occurred. So the crowds are expecting a political reformer, a new king, a warrior who was going to ride into Jerusalem and make everything right again by wielding a political agenda. And as Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, the crowds are shouting this strange word in this unified voice which reveals what they are expecting from Jesus. The word we all know is Hosanna, which translates in English to please save us. And again, this doesn't mean save the way that you and I use that word in the church today. The crowds in the story are literally shouting this word, asking Jesus to save them of things like military oppression and taxes being levied unfairly, inequality, inequity, marginalization, the neglect of the poor. And what's more, these things are important to Jesus. They are part of his message. But Jesus in their mind is this king who is going to come and fix everything political, material, and make the whole system right again. This is the Jesus that the crowds are welcoming into the city. 
shouting, please save us, please save us, Hosanna. And then we may be familiar with how the story goes. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He doesn't do any of what they're expecting. As a matter of fact, it just, the whole story goes south. A member of his inner circle by the name of Judas takes a bribe, betrays him. Jesus is captured, tortured, and then killed for insurrection by a gruesome form of capital punishment then called crucifixion. That is the real story. That is the real narrative. It's not just a story about palm branches. Now, as the church, as people of faith, we also have a lot of expectations when it comes to our ideas about God. We all think of God a little bit differently, and that's beautiful and that's wonderful. But we think to ourselves a lot, things like, who is God? What is God? What is God up to? What can God do for me? What can God do through me? What can God do for the world? These are the things that we're thinking about every time that we pray a prayer or participate in any kind of spiritual practice. And these things are also important to Jesus. But what we often find when we cry out to God, as the people did in this story, are our expectations being unmet. We hoped for one thing and we got another. God didn't do what we expected. And my question for us today is this. What if all that we are expecting from God actually does happen, but never as we think it should? What if God answers our own Hosanna, but just in God's way and in God's time, not according to our own? If you are taking notes today, write this little phrase down. You can put it on your refrigerator or something this week. Do not put it on the rear view mirror of your car. You will have an accident. <laughs> but this is what I want us to remember today. God always saves us, but not like we think God should. God always saves us, but not like we think God should. In her book, um, the author, the, the book is titled Kindled My Heart by the author Malti Shetty. She shares this beautiful story about how we get the things that we are expecting from God, even though they arrive through strange and disappointing circumstances sometimes. The story goes like this, and there are many variations of this story out there, so bear with me if you've heard it before. But there was this man who did not like his in-laws that lived with him because they were taking up too much space in his house. So he went to a spiritual teacher in his village who lived nearby and he said to him, please do something for me. I am going crazy. I cannot bear my in-laws anymore. They take up so much space in my house. And the teacher strangely responded, do you own any chickens? And the man said, yes, I have chickens with a confused look on his face. And the teacher looked him in the eye and he said, go back home and bring your chickens into the house. And so the man went home and brought in all of his chickens into the house. And a few days later came back very frustrated. And the teacher asked him, is your problem solved? And the man said, no, it's worse. Now there's chickens running all over the house, and my in-laws are still there, and my wife, and my kids. And the teacher calmly responded, well, do you have any sheep? And the man said, yeah, I have sheep. And he said, go home and bring them into the house. The man rolled his eyes and groaned a little bit, but obeyed the teacher and did, it, did as he said, and brought the sheep into the house. A few days later, he came back, and the teacher said, Problem solved? The man said, of course not. You know it's not. Now there's sheep and chickens and kids and in-laws and myself and my wife. It's an absolute nightmare. I can't even walk around without bumping into an animal. 
The teacher, of course, responds, do you own any dogs? And before the man could realize that he was answering the question and what that would lead to, he said, yeah, I have three of them. And then he regretted saying that because the teacher responded, bring your dogs into the house. So he did, and he finally came back a few days later, and he had completely had it. He said to the teacher, you have ruined my life. I came to you for help. You have made my life terrible. The house is a mess. There's animal stuff everywhere, and I can't even move around or relax in my own home. And the teacher said to him, good. Now, go back home. Send the chickens away. Send the sheep away. Send the dogs away. And so he went home, and he did it, and came back to the, few, the teacher a few days later, and he said, now I see what you were trying to teach me. The animals are all out of the house, and it seems that I have so much space. Thank you for fixing my problem. The man in this story has a common problem that many of us probably have. He wants more space where he lives. And how does the teacher solve his problem in this story? He does it by giving him even less space, followed by even less space, followed by even less space. The very thing that the man wanted was only found by getting the very opposite of what he wanted. He thought what he was in need of was more space when what he was really in need of was perspective. He wasn't looking at it rightly. Had he got what he wanted in the first place, all of the extra space in the world wouldn't have made any difference because his perspective never would have changed. And this is exactly how it is with our own expectations of God here in modernity. And this is how it is with the people in the story back in history who had expectations of Jesus. They thought that everything would be solved if Jesus would just fix all of their outer problems. And some of them very severe, valid things that were unjust and in need of fixing. And yet, God's plan all along was to fix it another way. After all, if everything got fixed in their outer lives and nothing changed in their inner lives, everything would eventually go right back to where it began because people would continue looking out at the world through distorted lenses. And so that is what Jesus is trying to work on is the lens, the perspective, the way that we look at things. Hosanna, Hosanna, please save us. And Jesus did save them, but not like they expected him to. And Jesus saves us today, but not like we expect him to. God always saves, but not like we expect him to. Where are you shouting Hosanna in your life today? What are you asking God to save you from today? What is it that you're wanting from God that you're never getting? I've got a few things. What is it for you? Maybe you're wanting a more satisfying career. Perhaps God is answering that request by keeping you right where you are in a job that you are not fond of because it's forming character and skills in you that is preparing you for something even better than you can possibly imagine down the road. Maybe you're wanting more money in your life. Who doesn't want more money in your life? I don't know how having more money can make a life worse, right? <laughs> Perhaps God is answering your request for more money by giving you even less than you want so that you can learn not to put your hope in riches. Maybe you're here this morning and 
you're sick, and I don't mean that you have a cold, but your body is in need of some serious healing. Perhaps God is answering your prayer for healing with very slow progress on the journey because he's giving you courage to face your deepest fears about your aging body. Maybe you're here this morning and you're lonely. Perhaps God is saving you by putting you next to the very people that are sitting around you right now. What is it for you? What do you want to be saved from? It might actually be happening right in front of you, but you're just not seeing it. The truth is that God cares about our lives so much that the condition of our souls, that deep part in us that reasons and loves and hopes and fears, that lens through which we view the entirety of the human experience, its condition, the health of our soul, is God's primary focus on our journey. It's why the book of Proverbs says, above all, keep your heart, for out of it your entire life flows. And wherever you are in your life today, I would just like to encourage you this morning and as we begin another week to stop resisting the things that are frustrating. To stop resisting the things that ache and the things that sting. To just be there and sit there and let those things be what they are. Whatever has come in the past, whatever is approaching in the future, embrace it with open arms, even if it's not what you're expecting. Even if the very thing you have been placing your hope in and asking God for all along gets betrayed and captured and crucified and buried. Because it will rise in its time. This is the hope of the gospel that as we go through life as usual, God does not promise us a life with flowers and balloons and money falling out of the sky. God promises us that whatever we face, God is with us and in us and in those around us. And we get through this life as we're supposed to by keeping one eye on God and one eye on each other. Although that might look a little strange. <laughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, you are beyond thought, beyond understanding, beyond names, beyond labels. And yet, in the person of Jesus, we see you at work in the world as one of us, teaching us things that often seem so upside down and so backwards. They're very hard to embrace and say yes to. But there's this suspicion, there's this inkling, there's this tiny little dot in each of us that is propelled to hope, is propelled to believe that. So we say yes this morning as much as we can and we ask that you would increase our capacity to say yes in an even deeper way. We might be afraid, we might feel lost, we might feel lonely, but we trust you anyway. And we keep placing our trust in me. May we become aware of you within us and within all those around us. Amen.